I have an interesting relationship with GraphQL. On one hand, I'm one of the biggest proponents of TRPC, which is well known for being the alternative to GraphQL that makes more sense to use nowadays. And on the other hand, I keynoted GraphQL Conf and was overall very positive about GraphQL. So much so that people questioned me afterwards asking if I actually meant that. Well, I do. I think GraphQL is an incredible technology that solves very specific problems for very large teams. But it has its gotchas, it has some catches, and it certainly isn't the easiest thing to set up or use, much less use correctly. Don't even get me started on how many degrees you need to get Relay working the way it's supposed to, because that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about GraphQL getting a good bit closer to the experience we'd expect from something like TRPC. The reason for that is a project called GraphQL.tada. I discovered this because Matt Pocock's been posting a bunch about it, both on Twitter and on YouTube, and been doing my own research and trying to learn a bit more, because this isn't the first time we've tried a project like this, despite how interesting its way of using TypeScript is. But why is TypeScript involved? What the hell even is GraphQL Tada? Let's dig in a bit. If somehow you're not familiar with GraphQL, one of the core concepts of GraphQL is a query. You write in GraphQL syntax the structure for the data that you want, and then you get returned a response when you query that thing. The type definitions are where things get interesting, though, because there's a schema that declares all of the different things that can exist in your GraphQL endpoint, and then the GraphQL syntax that describes what you actually want to grab. But now that you want this third thing, which is the type definition, so you can use that in your components in TypeScript, that's not a given. That's not a default, because you have to translate between a different language to get it. The way most tools solve this right now is by co-genning that third piece. There's a process running in the background that keeps track of whenever you change your GraphQL queries, and it generates new type definitions that are used in your components when you call them. It's a bit of a Mess. Do you know what else is a mess? The string parsing in TypeScript. You can write crazy types with string abuse within TypeScript. So much so that GraphQL ta -da, has shown how you can abuse it to generate type definitions straight from your GraphQL query. Let's take a quick look because this is insane. The goal here is to lower the friction between the TypeScript side and the GraphQL side. So you don't need that code gen step and you can just write things in TypeScript and it works. So in this example, where they're using the GraphQL helper from GraphQL. .tada, they call GraphQL, they write query Pokemons, Pokemon ID, and now they have the Pokemons query that they can use in their use query helper. It's actually not even theirs, it's URQL, which if you're familiar with, it's one of the best ways to do GraphQL without having to buy into something huge like Apollo. Now it's able to parse this string literal that you wrote in here with the little syntax there and generate type definitions from it. The project contains two installable modules, GraphQL.tada, which is the package providing the types and the runtime API as a library, as well as the NoCo GraphQL LSP, which is an LSP for GraphQL that's actually a TypeScript language service plugin that gives you the editor feedback and integration. So it's not just string hacks, huh? So the key piece you'll see here that if you haven't done much GraphQL before might not make sense, but if you have, will make a lot of sense. Traditionally, when you're editing a file like this and you're making a change to the query, you have to save the file to get type definitions because you have a plugin in the background that is constantly watching for the changes you make in order to generate the right types. But if you're using like TRPC, all of that exists within the language server in the editor. So you can be typing away, making a change, and without even saving, see another file throwing an error because the change you made breaks it. Having that level of feedback in your editor and not having to rely on external compiler steps to generate the right checks to give you the feedback you're looking for in your editor is huge, like huge, huge. And it's so cool to see the work that this team has done to get that level of seamless feedback in the GraphQL experience. Like if I skim over to here, you'll see you can map off of result.data and it knows the type of Pokemons and it knows that each of them has an ID and will throw an error if you try to access data that it doesn't have. This is not the default GraphQL experience. This is so much better than what you would normally expect in VS Code. As we go back in here, you'll see that currently the Pokemon component takes in nothing, but if they need this to get additional data, they can make this new GraphQL query for it that selects the Pokemon fields on a Pokemon. It's actually a fragment definition. If you're familiar with fragments, it's like almost like a partial within GraphQL, where you can use that piece in multiple places and also use it as a type definition for what this component needs. So here we specified that we don't just want an ID, we actually want a subset of the Pokemon fields, a fragment of, and we want this to have the name. So now we can read the name off of this fragment, but it looks like we're gonna get an error or something here. Cool, so we have name and flea rate. We'll just leave name is what I think he's doing here, yes. And here you're gonna see an error when it gets passed because Pokemon is missing one of the fields it needs. This is where things get really cool because you could specify at a component level, hey, I need this much data from a Pokemon. And now if you don't pass it that much data, you get a type error until the query includes all of the things that that component needs. And you can even import the fragment Pokemon fields and dump your value there. I am 
not necessarily in love with this syntax of having to like make this imaginary variable, so to speak. Because what's happening here is Pokemon Fields is getting passed in as a fragment in this array here. And then we're accessing this inside of here is bound on Pokemon because that's where it's created with this syntax there. But this is saying all the fields this requires should also be queried in this query. So now if we go back to the component and we make a change to the fragment, we don't have to change this parent because it's using the same fragment. It's all about following that source of truth, which is a really, really powerful pattern. And it's cool to see this unlocked inside of the GraphQL world. So let's continue reading about how it works. It's actually really interesting. I thought it was just using string hacks because if I recall, that's how Salty did it before. If you're not familiar with Salty Aim, be cautious scrolling through their Twitter profile. Phenomenally talented developer. They made Elysia JS, which is the best framework for doing web in Bun right now. If you want a really fast alternative, something like Express in Bun, Elysia is the tool for it, without question. As such, everything they work on is some crazy pile of modern hacks. And somewhat recently, like mid last year, Salty worked on GraphQL to TypeScript plugin. Mobius is what they named it in the end. They did a ton of work on this. Also, sorry for light mode based though. Salty's on the right side of these things. Having this level of control in GraphQL where you're like writing an object and then getting type safety on the other side. If I scroll a bit further in, you'll see now that we have this really deep data comments, data user slug. You can map the comments data and get the user slug just from this nested syntax. The way this works is it has to compile out a GraphQL query on one side and also infer type definitions on the other, which is inherently going to be a massive challenge. And it's an incredible achievement that Salty managed to get this working as quickly as they did. And I'm genuinely so impressed with what they did, which I wasn't surprised at all to see Salty quickly jump on why does this look familiar when they first saw Matt's video. Yeah, I had every intention to tag them in this, but yeah, as they said, they weren't intending to maintain their solution. So this one is really cool to see. So let's play because a certain very handy community member has built us a very handy demo. And we can go to our components. Here's the app. We create the client for calling GraphQL stuff from URQL. Again, URQL is probably the way I would do GraphQL nowadays. Think of it like almost like React query, but specifically for GraphQL stuff. Really handy. Here you have the Pokemon item and the Pokemon list. Oh, this is the example from the demo. Thank you, Gabriel, for pulling that out. So here we can see the GraphQL query for the Pokemon endpoint. Can I, I delete that, won't autocomplete. Interesting that whatever my prettier setup is caused that to break out and no longer be formatted correctly. That's a bit strange. I'll have to save without formatting to keep that from breaking. These are the little quirks you'll find working in GraphQL stuff. You got to get all the rules right for like the parsers to handle things correctly. It's silly that like as soon as you break that out like that, the highlighting breaks, but it does because good old GraphQL. But we're not here to bitch about the syntax and prettier doing its thing. We're here to actually play with this and what it is capable of doing. The thing I wanted to see is the autocomplete stuff. If I save that, will it still? Okay, it will. Oh, I know what I have to do. Again, with the weird quirks, since we're using a custom TypeScript anything, we can't just use the same TypeScript version that the editor uses because it's not going to see all this stuff. So in order to fix that, we have to tell the editor to use the version of TypeScript that we are using in this project. So. TypeScript select TypeScript version, manually use workspace version. And now all the type definitions are going to start working. It's dumb and annoying, but VS Code be VS Code. And they won't let you, by default, use the TypeScript version in your project. This bites so many people and so many things. It's dumb, but it is what it is. A rant for another day. So here, I added the name field, but we're still missing those other fields. So we're going to get a type error here because we're not including those fragments. That error is unreadable, but with the prettier TypeScript errors, it's a little better. This isn't assignable to the type with uh, Pokemon item, the fragment ref. Uh, name and ID are missing, but required in this type definition. The type error is not great, but it's there. In this fragment snippet, we define a fragment named Pokemon item on Pokemon, and it's these fields. Putting words to what a fragment is is hard. You can kind of think of it like a set of rules that we want to have access to in other places. We could define multiple fragments in here, so we could do like fragment, a Pokemon item with more on Pokemon. And this can have ID, name, maybe we also have like image. That not an option on here? Let's see what other options we have. I think sprite should be an option, right? Whatever, we'll put types. Field types is not used. Do I have to put things in here? Let's just take a look at the schema. You'll find most of your time with the GraphQL code base is looking at schemas. Okay, types are just an array of Pokemon type. And Pokemon type should just be an enum, yeah, cool. So we're just gonna drop types there. Even though it's not being used, 
something that we might want in the future. It's weird that it marks that as not being used. So now when I go back here, since we're dumping the Pokemon item fragment, any fragments we've defined in here are accessible in this query because we put them there. This is kind of like dependency injection is the wrong word, but what's happening here is we're getting access to the fragments that we defined inside of our query here. So I could do, instead of just Pokemon item, I should now have access to the Pokemon item with more. And I should be able to do that here instead and have it still work, which it does. And also if we scroll down here, we should be able to see undefined fragment, joy. The, the joy of GraphQL. <laughs> Can I not have multiple fragments defined at once here like that? Not the issue? That seems to have shut that up. Yeah, Pokemon fragment with more. Interesting. I'm just really surprised this is there like that. I'll try this, Pokemon.type. If I do that, cool, that goes away. That's actually really cool that it's smart enough to correctly flag that because we are aren't using it. That I didn't expect. That's a level of introspection that I'm blown away with. If I delete this, that goes yellow unused. That's nuts, actually. What the hell? Because that, that's like, I, if you don't get why this is so crazy, I will, I will quickly remind you, these are two different programming languages that happen to exist in the same file. So for it to be able to syntax highlight correctly in the GraphQL language, when something in the TypeScript language is or isn't using it is actually pretty nuts. And then back here, since I changed the name of that, this has to be correct. And again, you could type error if it's not, that's nuts. There's some really cool stuff here. And as for like, honestly, I'm gonna command S and, and break this because I'm sure it will still work. Like if I go to the page now, it has the types. I'll add a quick dot join there. And now we see the Pokemon colon the types. This works because of the insane number of hacks they're doing. The reason the syntax highlighting isn't working is the VS Code plugin that I'm using for the syntax highlighting that should work in here breaks if you do this new line syntax and don't have it like that. Annoying, but text formatting is never easy. You get the idea though, that's actually really cool. And the idea of this type of control flow where a specific component can say, I need all of this data. So the parent can then grab the fragment and apply it means architecting with a giant front end team where these things are being made by different people. And this component might not be able to do the queries itself. That's huge. That's huge, huge. Someone asked, is types type safe? It is. You have the array of all of the possible types. The one thing you'll see in here is the or null in the or null here as well. This is kind of a necessary evil of GraphQL. Effectively, every single thing in GraphQL is nullable because you never know what part of the fragment has or hasn't been resolved. So you're kind of stuck treating every single thing as nullable, which is why we see so many question marks whenever we see an example using GraphQL stuff. Because even after you've asserted stuff, you still never know. Even here, we've asserted that we have Pokemons here. We've already confirmed that, but it's still possible for ID to be null. So we have to handle that case by just passing the index here instead. And these little things don't go away with this plugin, which is sad because these little things suck and are one of the main things I'm frustrated about with GraphQL. But the overall win here is massive. I don't wanna downplay that when I express minor frustrations with how GraphQL makes everything nullable. Yeah, that's really cool. Good stuff. Yeah, if I was using GraphQL right now, I'd be deep on this, that's for sure. I. Can't believe I'm talking about GraphQL again, but here we are. Turns out somebody made something cool in the space and I'm actually really curious about it. Again, I don't recommend GraphQL for everybody. If you don't have a fully separated backend and front end, especially if those aren't different languages, GraphQL probably doesn't make sense for you. I'll make sure my editors put up the chart that I love to show off of where GraphQL does and doesn't fit compared to other technologies. That said, really cool to see what the team's doing and I hope this work continues going forward. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Are you still using GraphQL or have you moved on to TRPC or just given up and used REST or Protobuf? That's all I have to say. Until next time, peace nerds.